What a wonderful privilege it is for me to welcome you to this wonderful Sabbath experience. I pray that you have been having a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. I'm happy that you have chosen to join us, to be with us as we begin this beautiful series. We are going to be examining together the beautiful biblical doctrine of the sanctuary. This doctrine is key and it is fundamental to us as Seventh-day Adventists. In fact, it is the only unique doctrine to us. Every other doctrine that we have, historically, we have borrowed from other Christian denominations. But this doctrine of the sanctuary is unique to us in that out of the 1844 Great Disappointment, it gave us a unique perspective on the heavenly ministry of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, it helps us to better understand uh, the great controversy theme. It helps us to understand the beautiful doctrines of the Bible. And so to us as Seventh-day Adventists, this doctrine of the sanctuary is key. And so this morning, allow me to welcome you and to just say thanks for joining us. I pray that you've invited a friend, invited a loved one. We want to share that message to all the world. That's what Jesus has called us to do. He says, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world. And that's why we are here, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the world and package it so beautifully as God has done in the doctrine of the sanctuary. So join me as we acknowledge the presence of God this morning in prayer. Join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that you have given to us to be gathered here this morning Present to us the beauty of your word. Open to us the joy of your kingdom, the joy of salvation. Reveal to us our Savior. Reveal to us Jesus Christ. And may our souls be watered as we sit at your feet this morning. We thank you through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Amen and amen. The message of the sanctuary is designed to prepare a people to walk by faith. To prepare us to meet Jesus when he comes. To prepare us for that which is about to come upon the world. The Bible says there's going to be a time of trouble. As was never was. But we are to prepare for that time of trouble. The message of the sanctuary is designed to develop. To build God's people. And to prepare us. For when Jesus shall come again. And so I ask you to pray for me. As we go through this series of messages. I ask that you present me to our Father in heaven as the Holy Spirit to anoint me afresh as by the grace of God I seek to share those messages with us that we can then share it to a world that is dying in sin. Our key text this morning, the key text that we want to use throughout the series comes from Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18. But before we go to Proverbs chapter, chapter 4, verse 18, allow me to, to, to give some setting, set up this verse of scripture for us. This is the wise man speaking. And he says in verse 16 of Proverbs chapter 4, he says, enter not into the path of the wicked. Enter not into the path of the wicked, for in the path of the wicked, there is destruction, there is death, there is chaos. And at the end, separation from God. What he says to the believers in verse 18, he says, But the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more onto a perfect day. While the path of the wicked leads to death, the path of the just leads to salvation. It leads to life. It leads to eternity. And so this passage of scripture underlies everything that we're going to be doing for this series. It's a path that leads to eternal life and praise God in the sanctuary. God has revealed to us the path of the just. This morning, we want to begin the series as we talk about the way maker the way maker who is that way maker is jesus christ 
You see, the Bible tells us that at the creation of mankind, when God created man in the Garden of Eden at the beginning, the Bible tells us that man enjoyed what is described as a face-to-face -face relationship with God. Man did not talk to God on Zoom. Praise God. I look forward to that day when we shall no longer be in need of Zoom. Zoom shall pass away, the Bible says. But Adam and Eve, our first parents, created there in innocence, created in righteousness, created in holiness, experienced a face-to-face -face communion with their father, experienced a face-to-face -face communion with their creator. There was nothing that stood between mankind and God. Man was blessed to experience a perfect fellowship with Jehovah. We are yet to comprehend this. As sinful mortal human beings, we, we don't know what this is like. Adam and Eve deprived us of that, but praise God, there is coming a day, Jesus says, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. I look forward to that day, what about you? There was nothing that prevented Adam and Eve from coming into the very presence of the glory of their creator. What a wonderful experience they had with God. However, with the advent of sin, with the coming of sin, that privilege that Adam and Eve had of entering into the very presence of God, that privilege was lost. Sin entered into the experience of mankind. Adam and Eve became sinners by nature and by practice, by action, they became sinners. And God, listen to this, God in his mercy shut man out of his immediate presence so the life of man could be preserved. You see, God is holy. God is omnipotent. God is awesome. God is glorious. And so man in his sinful nature could not be permitted to stand or to be in the immediate presence of a holy and a righteous God for his glory could consume man. And so the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2, what your iniquities, he says, have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, my brothers and sisters, my dear friends, my little ones, sin separated us from our father. Sin separated us from our Jesus. Sin separated us from our creator. But God can't stand to be away from those whom he has created. Praise God, we serve a God who wants to be in fellowship with us. And this God, this glorious God is going to devise a way to bring man back into his presence. Praise God. You see, one of the most successful methods of memorizing things is to associate those things with pictures. Teachers know that very well particularly as they deal with children. Children remember abstract concepts as they associate those abstract things with what they see. God works the same way because it was God who created us and gave us that kind of mind. You see, humans, when God created us, us humans, he created us to be extremely visual. He created us to see and to perceive the things that we see pictures and help us to understand the abstract principles of stories. They help us to understand and to remember the abstract principles that we hear. So as we hear things, we associate them with the things that we see and we are able to better and more easily remember those things. God who designed the human being that way is going to use the very principle 
to teach us the plan of salvation. Now look at this. Stay with me this morning. Although God explained the plan of salvation to Adam and Eve, after Adam and Eve had sinned, after they had disobeyed God by doing that which God told them not to do, after sin had entered into the experience of man, God explained to man the plan of salvation as God addressed the devil in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. God spoke the plan of salvation and God said, I God, I Jehovah, I the creator, I will put enmity, I will put separation, I will put hatred between you, the devil, and the woman, my church, my people, and between your seed, that's sin, the seed of the devil is sin. I'm going to put a separation, I'm going to put hatred between sin and my people. How is God going to do that? How is God going to do that? God says in the process of bringing this hatred between you, the devil, and my people, in the process of creating a separation between sin and my people, you, the devil, you're going to bruise the seed of the woman, that's Jesus, but the seed of the woman is going to crush or mash up your head. In the plan of salvation, when everything is worked out, the devil, that serpent, Satan is going to be destroyed. Jesus is going to crush his head. But while Jesus is doing that, the devil is going to get a chance to bruise his heel. The devil got that chance when he allowed wicked and sinful and man to hang Jesus on a cross. The savior of mankind, the creator of the human race, for he was the one who created us. The Bible tells us all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. When the devil inspired wicked men to take their creator and to hang him on a cross, a cruel cross, on Calvary's hill, the devil got the opportunity to bruise the heel of Jesus. But praise God, while he was bruising Jesus' heel, Jesus was crushing his head. Now look at this, look at this. Although God explained that to them, that explanation in and of itself, as adequate as it was, as powerful as it was, God also gave them a demonstration, a visual aid, because that which we see helps us to understand the abstract concepts that we hear. So God told them, God preached to them the plan of salvation, but also, God also demonstrated that plan to them. How did God demonstrate that? He told Adam and Eve, I want you to kill a lamb. I want you to kill that lamb. And God was going to take the skin of that lamb to make aprons for Adam and Eve. Remember, they had, they had covered themselves with fig leaves, but the fig leaves began to wither away and their nakedness began to show. And God gave them a more permanent solution to their problem by giving them the skin of that animal to cover themselves as God was doing that, God was demonstrating to them the plan of salvation, hallelujah, that one day the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world would come unto the earth. And as Adam and Eve, as they slew that Lamb, they began to understand that it was their hands that was going to take the life of the Son of God. It was their actions, it was their sins. That was going to cause the death of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. As they slew that lamb, they saw in their mind's eye that God would send his Son to come upon the earth to die for mankind. And so when John the Baptist, praise God, saw Jesus walking down the banks of the river Jordan, John the Baptist cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God, who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. Adam and Eve had a panoramic view of the future and they saw Jesus himself, the lamb that would take away the sins of the world. You see, 
although God spoke the plan of salvation to Adam and Eve, he also demonstrated that plan as he asked them to kill that first lamb. Adam and Eve passed that message on to their children. Abel practiced that. It actually caused his death. It was passed on to, from one generation to the next. Enoch did it. Noah and all the succeeding generation killed the lamb. As it demonstrated God's plan of salvation. That without the shedding of blood. There is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no erasing or eradicating of our sin. That message was passed on to Abraham. And as Abraham journeyed from one place to the next, he set up altars upon which he offered the lamb. That principle of salvation was passed on to Isaac and unto Jacob, and Jacob passed it on to his children. But the children of Israel, the 12 tribes, went into Egypt. And after about 220 years, they became slaves. And for the next 200 years, they served as slaves. And after 400 years in Egypt, the children of Israel had forgotten God. They had forgotten God's ways. They had forgotten the plan of salvation. God is about to, 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 to liberate the children of Israel from Egyptian slavery, from Egyptian bondage, because they, the children of Israel, are his instruments to preach the plan of salvation to a world that is dying in sin. And God, after 420 years in Egypt, the, 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 the children of Israel had forgotten their God. They had forgotten the plan of salvation. And God has to reintroduce himself to the children of Israel. Even the one who was chosen to lead them out of Egyptian bondage, Moses, God had to reintroduce himself to Moses. When, when he spoke to Moses, Moses had to ask, whom shall I say is the one who is sending me? Who is sending me? Neither Moses nor the children of Israel had a personal encounter with Jehovah. So all Jehovah could say to Moses, listen, I am that I am. Who am I going to tell you? They don't know who I am. I'm about to reintroduce myself to them. So God takes the children of Israel. He delivers them. Look at God. Look at God this morning. God takes the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. He takes them into the wilderness. His intention is to take them into Canaan. And God is about to reintroduce himself to the children of Israel. He is about to woo them to himself. God is about to speak sweet words into their ears. So he can reintroduce himself to them as their creator, their redeemer, their friend. And God is about to do that in the most dramatic, most beautiful, most, most creative way. God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. God says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now remember, 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 remember this. Sin brings a separation between us and God. Sin separated us from our creator. Sin separated us from our redeemer. Sin separated us from the one who wanted to be in fellowship with us. But God says, listen, Moses, I want you to build a sanctuary that I, the holy, righteous, and perfect God, can come dwell in the midst of a perverse and sinful people. You see, when God told Moses to build the sanctuary that I may come dwell among them, the children of Israel did not yet have anything right. They were not a righteous and holy nation. No, they were a nation of sinners. Unclean people. Yet God in his mercy, comprehend that. God in his mercy wanted to dwell in the presence of sinners. 
That's the God we serve. He says to Moses, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. You see, when God dwells among us, we will get a chance to know him. God doesn't want us to get to know him on Zoom and by WhatsApp. No, God wants to have a face-to-face. -face. God wants to have vibes with us. God wants to sit down and talk with us. No long-distance relationship. Uh -uh. God says, I want to come dwell with you. I want to live among you. What a mighty God we serve. Listen to this. So Moses built. Moses built that sanctuary. Read this, read this, read this. Read this with me. It says what? The structure and the ceremonies. The sanctuary, there are two significant things about the sanctuary. There is the structure. We're going to get into some details as, as we go into next week. We're going to get into some details into the structure of the sanctuary. Outer court, holy place, most holy place. The, 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 outer, the outer curtains. These, all these are structures. Altar of burnt offerings, furniture, lava basin, all the things in the holy place, all the things in the most holy place. All these make up the structure. But the sanctuary also has, has ceremonies or had ceremonies. Daily sacrifices, annual feasts, different offerings. All the structure and all the ceremonies together in the Old Testament sanctuary were designed to serve as symbols. What's the word? Symbols. To illustrate two things, the sequence and the process of salvation. Salvation has both a sequence and a process. Sequence means some things must happen first. Something must happen in, in, in a sequential order. Salvation has a sequential order. And that sequential order gives us a process. And so the structure and the ceremonies, somebody ought to write this down. The structure and the ceremonies of the sanctuary were designed by God to help us to understand both the sequence and the process of salvation. And so God gave Moses, listen to this, God gave Moses the exact plans for everything in the sanctuary. Mo God did not leave it up to Moses to decide the length and breadth and height of anything. Ah, God told Moses exactly every iota, every little detail of the sanctuary, God gave that to Moses. The colors, everything. You see, keep, keep this in mind, keep this in mind, keep this in mind. You ready for this? When God told Moses, this is so simple that it is profound. When God told Moses to build the sanctuary in the wilderness, God already had a dwelling place in heaven. God was not homeless. God was not looking for a place to hide. God already had a dwelling place in heaven where the plan, get this, where the plan of salvation was already in process. When I'm going to repeat this. When God told Moses to build the sanctuary on earth, God already had a dwelling place in heaven where the plan of salvation was already in process. So why did God tell Moses to build the sanctuary? So we as humans could get a visual demonstration of the plan of salvation, to get an understanding of the mighty God that we serve, to get an understanding of the mercy and the grace of God that he has extended to mankind. God is about to reveal himself to the children of Israel and through the children of Israel to mankind. And so he says to Moses in verse 9 of Exodus chapter 25, he says to him, make this tabernacle. 
met this sanctuary and all its furnishings, all the furniture in there, make them exactly like the pattern that I will show you. Make it like, make it the way that I want you to make it. It must be according to the pattern. What pattern? The pattern of salvation that is already going on in heaven. God was already the savior of mankind. God was already saving sinners from sin. And so the sanctuary, the Old Testament sanctuary there was to demonstrate to us the plan of salvation that was already taking place and all the things that God already had in mind to do for and through the human race. The coming of the Messiah in human flesh, the death of the Messiah, the resurrection of the Messiah, the ascension of the Messiah, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the destruction of sin and, and, and death and hell, an everlasting life, and the ceaseless ages of eternity to come, God was going to reveal all of that to us in the sanctuary, and we are going to look at some of this this week. That is coming. You can't afford to miss any of the messages. Invite a friend, invite a loved one. Pray for me, pray over these messages. This is the end time message that God has sent to a world that is dying in sin. It's a message that demonstrates the way of salvation, the way back to God. Remember, sin brought a separation between us and God. But God has designed a bridge that is going to take us back to him, praise God. And in the sanctuary, God demonstrates for us, God explains in detail how he's going to get sinners back to himself. How is going to reconcile mankind? And I'm going to jump ahead this morning into 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, where Paul writes, God was in Christ, reconciling the world back to himself. That's the plan. And God reveals that to us in the sanctuary. And so the psalmist writes, in Psalm 77, verse 13, Thy way, O oh God. Your way, God, is revealed in the sanctuary. <laughs> the psalmist writes this as though he's informing God of something. That was God's plan. To reveal himself in the sanctuary. To reveal his way. What way? The way of salvation. The way of redemption. The way of reconciliation. The way God has been revealed to us in the sanctuary. And is it any wonder that when Jesus walked among us as a man, as God manifested himself in human flesh through Jesus Christ, Jesus cries out in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, what way, the way revealed in the sanctuary. The psalmist says the way of God is in the sanctuary. Jesus says, I know I am that way. And so this morning, this morning, this morning, my beloved brothers and sisters, my beloved ladies and gentlemen, my beloved little children, the way of salvation that has been revealed in the sanctuary is Jesus Christ. He's the only way. The only way of salvation. And that's why we are doing this series this week, this coming week. We want to talk about the way of salvation. We want to talk about God's way of redemption. We want to talk about Jesus. We're going to be talking about Jesus this week. May God open before us the beauty of his kingdom. So why? Why do we study the sanctuary? Why do we need to study the sanctuary? Why do we need to study that, that, that most all-important subject? God helps us to understand this. Listen to this. It is coming from the book Evangelism, chapter 8. Chapter 8 is entitled, well, there's a section in chapter 8 called the Sanctuary Truth. There are five key points in that chapter that I want to share with us. And this is going to be our key thought. We have a key text, Proverbs 4, verse 18, but we also have a key passage. This is our key passage. 
Evangelism chapter 8, the section entitled The Sanctuary Truth. There are five important sections there. Listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. The correct understanding of the ministration of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. This is a foundational biblical truth that we ought to understand because God has called us to preach it. We can't preach that which we do not understand. Number two says, this subject should be understood clearly by all adults, youth, and children. God has called us to understand this fundamental doctrine of the Bible. This is not an Adventist doctrine. This is a Bible doctrine. Number three says what? Without this, without this understanding, it will be impossible for us to exercise faith and hold our positions in the last days. You see, there's a time of trouble that is coming upon us, a time of trouble as we have never seen before. And in order to go successfully through this time of trouble, God has to develop a faith in us. And so the path of the just, this sanctuary message is designed to develop a generation who is going to walk by faith. In these last days. Point number four says. The sanctuary in heaven. Is the very center of Christ's work. We are to understand. What our high priest is doing in heaven for us today. And finally it says. We should be earnest. Earnest means deliberate. Purposeful. Students of prophecy. And the sanctuary and we should not rest we should not rest until we become intelligent in the subject of the sanctuary listen to what god says to us listen to what god says to us in, the, in ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 28 it says the nations the king james version says the heathens those who do not know god will know those who do not know god will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy. I am the one who sanctify you when my sanctuary is among you forevermore. No, God cannot be talking about the physical sanctuary. He's talking about the principles of the sanctuary. The principles of holiness. The principles of righteousness. The principles of atonement. The principles of separation from sin. When the heathens see the gospel of Jesus Christ being manifested in the lives of the believer, they will understand that there is a God who makes people holy. And so today I want to invite you to join us for the next few days we rest on thursday night but i want to invite you and i want to encourage you to bring a friend bring a loved one as we examine this fundamental doctrinal truth of the bible the sanctuary message and its implication for god's people in the last days may god bless us may god reveal his way of salvation the path of the just to us and may our lives be transformed may we never be the same again and may the kingdom of god continue to grow god bless you and as we prepare for tomorrow night this is our reading assignment leviticus chapter 16 leviticus chapter 16 and patriarchs and prophets chapter 30 may god bless you may god's holy spirit continue to anoint you Pray for the preacher. Pray for your pastor. And may we see each other tomorrow night. God bless you in a real special way. God bless.